It's time to eat. What are you hungry for? Sit down and get ready to consume an abundance of fantasy football knowledge from Ross Tucker and Joe Dolan. Feed me now! I'm starving! On the Fantasy Feast Eating Podcast. Yeah, let's eat, baby! It is the Fantasy Feast Eating Podcast, presented, of course, by DraftKings. We love those dudes. The best place to play a little DFS this weekend with the Sunday slate. Head over to DraftKings. You know, I actually haven't even given you guys a code over there in a while. Let me see what code I got for you. Um, All right. Stepped up, same game parlays. Take your shot and even bigger NFL payout. Boost your winnings each leg up to 100%. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Use code ROSS. New customers can bet $5 on the conference championships and get 200 in free bets instantly only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code Ross. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. I love this show because I love Joe. That's Joe Dolan. Love the energy. Love the passion. Love the information. He loves it. That's what's important. At FG underscore Dolan of Fantasy Points fame, of course. I'm Ross Tucker, at Ross Tucker NFL on social. We're at Ross Tucker Pod. We're up on Twitter and Instagram. Facebook has a Ross Tucker Pod account now. And then for TikTok, follow me, at Ross Tucker NFL. Joe, here's what I'm thinking today. I want to make sure we do a thorough breakdown of the two conference championship games, obviously, like basically every skill guy. And then if we have a little extra time left over, just kind of want to pick your brain on, you know, moving forward, potentially some of these other teams that lost this past weekend, whether it's the Cowboys or the Bills or the Jags or the Giants, just kind of what you're thinking about some of their fantasy guys while it's still top of mind. Sound good? Sounds good to me. All right, let's start then with the 3 o'clock game on Sunday, 3 p.m. Eastern. It's the Philadelphia Eagles hosting the San Francisco 49ers. Really curious. We can start – well, let's just start with the Niners having the football, Joe. Who do you think has a chance to have a big day? Who do you not think? What's going on? Um, Based on what I saw last week, and that's just last week, it could be a tough day for the Niners. I mean, Brock Purdy, look, I, I, I tweeted this about Brock Purdy, and people are like, well, you know, you're not being – no, I think I am being fair. I don't think it's discounting anything that Brock Purdy has done. He was Mr. Irrelevant. He was the final pick in the NFL draft. He's a rookie, and he has his team in the NFC Championship game. Those are all facts. Those are all impressive facts. I do think, watching the games, Purdy has had a couple of throws that if somebody doesn't drop the ball, somebody doesn't take a bad angle, we're like, oh, my Lord, what is he doing? I think there's a little bit of a run of luck that Brock Purdy is on. The San Francisco 49ers scored one offensive touchdown last week. Dallas just couldn't move the football. So I think this is a potential tough spot for Purdy because Philadelphia's pass rush, very good, just like Dallas's. Philadelphia's secondary is better than Dallas's. Um, What I think is they really need Christian McCaffrey to get going, but Christian McCaffrey's dealing with a calf injury. So we don't know exactly how close to 100% Uh, He is Saquon Barkley last week had uh, 82 yards from scrimmage on 11 touches. Of course, uh, 35 of that came on a single run. So I'm not really sure how much uh, we could read into that for Philadelphia. Now, Brock Purdy, 7-0 as a starter. No rookie quarterback has ever won a conference championship game. So I I don't think that necessarily matters this week, but it just goes to show you what kind of rare air he's in, what kind of position he's in. Um, What I would think here, I think the best opportunity for the 49ers to make plays is get confusing at the line of scrimmage with Christian McCaffrey and Debo Samuel. I'm not 
I'm not breaking any news there. Christian McCaffrey and Debo Samuel are their best offensive players. So I think that's what they need to do to kind of protect Brock Purdy. Get the ball out of his hands early because I certainly think Kyle Shanahan is going to say, man, the longer he stands back there in that pocket and that pass rush gets to him, maybe some of these balls that are hitting the turf, they're going to go into the hands of defenders. Um, And I think that is why the Eagles are favored uh, two and a half, three points right now. Um, I thought if if San Francisco looked the way it has throughout most of its um, uh, uh, of its twelve game winning streak, I thought this would be closer to a pick up. Um, and uh, the books actually at, at points essentially have San Francisco power rated higher than the Eagles. You get a home point advantage. I'm not so sure they have that anymore. So I think despite San Francisco's win last week, I do think. Um, the books, the markets are a little tiny bit concerned about Brock Purdy in this spot. It is not taking anything away from Brock Purdy. It is just a concern. I, I, the 49ers are going to have to rely on yards after the catch. McCaffrey, I, uh, well, Ayuk too. I mean, the guy, the guy's a stud. George Kittle, Debo, all those guys creating plays, maybe forcing the Eagles to tackle. That has been a problem for the Eagles at points this year. So I think that is a big... Uh, possibility for the 49ers I'm not so sure how much they want Brock Purdy taking five and seven step drops and looking down the field against this secondary which completely shut out the Giants receivers last week what about Kittle what about Jawan Jennings is there somebody like a Jennings or an Ayuk that people could have in their lineups that there's a chance that those guys well I think Jawan is Juan Jennings, you know, slot receiver, third down kind of guy. Um, Avante Maddox, we, it's Wednesday morning. There's no practice reports. It doesn't seem like Avante Maddox, the Eagles slot corner, was particularly close to playing last week. And if you think there's a spot on that defense that is exploitable, it's probably the linebackers at the second level. And the fact that they're down to their backup slot corner, which is now C.J. Gardner-Johnson, by the way. He was playing safety, but he's now their slot and he's good at it. Um, but Reed Blankenship, the uh, the the undrafted uh, safety, he's probably a guy they might look to exploit with George Kittle. On the other side, when the Eagles have the ball, they got a lot of weapons, Joe. I mean, they just massacred the Giants, and they didn't even really use A.J. Brown or Devontae Smith that much. Yeah, Devontae um, has kind of become, I guess, Jalen Hurts' go-to guy until A.J. Brown becomes their go-to guy. And that is where... The 49ers are exploitable. We saw DK Metcalf go nuts against them two weeks ago. We saw CeeDee Lamb go nuts against them last week. If Jalen Hurts has time to throw, he can go after um, this secondary. And I actually expect that's what the Eagles are going to do. That's not to say Miles Sanders won't get some carries here and there. But you know, uh, Eagles fans since the Andy Reid era, oh, we got to run the ball more. Well, last week they did it extremely well against the Giants. I'm just not sure that's the way Nick Sirianni and company are going to want to attack the 49ers. I think they're going to view this secondary as exploitable. And it's going to come down to kind of the way it came down to for the 49ers last week. Can they force Jalen Hurts to turn the ball over a couple of times? Can they get Nick Bosa after Jalen Hurts? You know, Lane Johnson is dinged up. Um, Nick Bosa is going to, that's going to be a battle. Lane Johnson made it through last week with the groin injury. But in Jordan Mailata is a really good left tackle. He's beatable. Um, so I think that's where the 49ers are going to try to win the game. I mean, that's how they've done it every this year. Get the pass rush going, force some turnovers. Um, not exactly sure. Um, uh the 49ers is a great matchup for Dallas Goddard. They average the eighth fewest fantasy points per game allowed to tight ends during the regular season. Dalton Schultz did score last week, but I kind of call that the Fred Warner effect. We, everybody saw him streaking down the scene with CeeDee Lamb last week. He's the best coverage linebacker in football, which is going to make things probably a little bit tougher on Dallas Goddard this week. I think it's an A.J. Brown game. I think it's a Devontae Smith game. Um, the 49ers allowed the fewest fantasy points per game to running backs. During the regular season, that's why I think this is a Hertz Smith, A.J. Brown game against the San Francisco 49ers for the Eagles. The same way it's been all year. Hertz Smith, A.J. Brown. Those are the guys that I think the Eagles are going to say we're going to play to our strengths. Jalen Hurts played a clean game last week. Probably is going to have to do more this week in order to get past the 49ers. But that, but this is their opportunity to throw the ball all over the yard with this spectacular young wide receiver duo. Kind of how I think it'll go down as well. 
Joe, I, I think the Eagles are going to try to throw the ball to Devontae Smith and A.J. Brown and like their matchups on the outside. I would agree. Yeah. In terms of anybody playing like a Sunday slate, is there a chance for uh, Quez? Quez? Quez didn't even like – Quez was splitting the reps with Pascal last yeah, year. Yeah, and I think – Quez splitting the reps with Pascal is more of a we're going to block for our run game kind of thing for the Eagles. There is one name for Philadelphia. Um, I want to pull up his numbers over the last uh, couple of weeks here. A guy who's been very quietly having a strong second half of the season. Although, I mean, last week was by far his best game. It's Kenny Gainwell. Um, he's Ooh, been kind of, I like that one, He's Joe. been kind of their short yardage kind of back, believe it or not, even though he's – And their third smoke. down back. And their third down back. Um, caught a pass for nine yards. I, I mean, I, I'm digging deep here. I go back to their game against Dallas uh, in week 16, their last like super competitive game. He had four catches for 41 yards. He's going to get some snaps. And if they're throwing the ball a lot in this game, I think he's a guy who might benefit from some checkdowns, especially if the pass rush gets after Jalen Hurts. So there's maybe a, a, an Eagle. Uh, last week he ran for 112 yards against the Giants. I mean, the Eagles pulled their starters in the second half of that game. So uh, I, I think um, I, I think Kenny Gainwell might be a guy who can who can be a cheap addition to your uh, to your report. Also, Elijah Mitchell, by the way, uh, with uh, with with Christian McCaffrey a little dinged up. But Mitchell's dinged up as well. So uh, that that San Francisco backfield's a little uh, problematic right now. Let's get to the Bengals and the Chiefs game. Um, this will be the six thirty p.m. Eastern time game yeah. in Kansas City. No neutral site, thankfully. Um, we'll start with the Bengals on offense. Joe, I know you know this, but Burrow is really impressive. Yeah, he's he's super he he reminds me of like a Brady Manning type in that he's beating people with his brain. He's yeah, just that smart. He's a dog too. He's super competitive. Um, I mean, like I said it last week. And everybody knows this now. Like, we have to find a way to talk about Mahomes where we can compare other guys to him where you're not, like, saying, oh, he's better than Mahomes. And, like, I think that's just human nature. People are sick of being like, oh, yeah, Patrick Mahomes is the best. Like, but, man, Joe Burrow, he's he's just a different kind of player than Patrick Mahomes. And right now, you know, we saw this game open Kansas City one and a half. It's split. It's flipped. It's Cincinnati is now a one point favorite. And with Mahomes' injury status, I'm not so sure that's, I'm not so sure that's a bad thing. You know, Cincinnati, if you're looking at um, why maybe the, the markets or Vegas would set this line where it is, well, look at, just look at the trends. Cincinnati is the best team in the entire AFC against the spread. They're 13, four and one. Kansas City is a massive public team but they're the worst team against the spread in the AFC at 5-12-1. So Kansas City gets money every week, and if you bet on Kansas City every week, you're, 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 you got somebody at your door coming looking for their money, okay? Because Kansas City has been terrible against the spread, and now Cincinnati's favored, and with the way Cincinnati played last week, with the way Joe Burrow played last week vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Patrick Mahomes being injured, I don't know if I can argue with that. Um, Cincinnati, uh, Jamar Chase, T. Higgins – they're the type of guys who can get after you in this matchup, as you well know. Chase has scored nine times in his last nine games. He didn't score against Kansas City the last time they played, but he still had 97 yards receiving uh, in that game. Um, T. Higgins did score against the Chiefs in early December, despite having only five targets. Um, so Joe Mixon, by the way, had a great game last week. Samaj P. Ryan ran more. Yeah, I don't think out. anybody was expecting that, Joe. No, I wasn't expecting Mixon to have that game. But if you're expecting maybe like a traditional, the total here is 47, which is probably a little low for a Chiefs, uh, for a Chiefs Bengals game. I think that accounts for the Mahomes injury. Samaj P. Ryan still ran more routes than Joe Mixon last week um, and caught uh, and uh, caught five passes. Samaj P. Ryan is an under the radar guy in a in a projected competitive game against that Chiefs pass rush to get into your lineup. Uh, uh, he could catch four or five passes yet again in this matchup. Other than that, I mean, Cincinnati's pretty cut and dry. Maybe Trent Irwin's a guy you can you can throw out there and hope he catches a, a short touchdown pass. Um, uh, Hayden Hurst, by the way, five uh, for 59, almost scored a touchdown uh, against the, sh the, uh, the Bills last week. So 
Cincinnati's humming right now. The offensive line still a concern, but it held up extremely well. I, Ross, you had to have been impressed with that performance. Yeah, I mean, it's, it was wild to be on the sideline while it snowed the whole game. I was impressed with how well they were able to throw and catch the ball in the snow. I just can't believe that the Bills got run on like that. Mixon was physical. The O-line was blocking well. It felt like the Bengals had better footing than the Bills did on the Bills' home turf there in the snow. Um, and Mixon, Mixon felt like the forgotten man this year. I mean, wasn't Mixon like, aren't the Bengals the pass-happiest team in the NFL? And yet, in that game, they were able to lean yeah. on Mixon and pound them. And, and I almost wonder if – I know we're going to talk about um, – we can maybe get an early start on talking about the teams that were eliminated last week. Just, um, just one thought. I mean, it almost feels like the Bengals – came into Buffalo and played the game people kind of think Buffalo plays. Oh, Josh Allen's a big guy, you know. They're a physical team. And Buffalo is kind of a finesse team here down the stretch. And they weren't able to run the football. And Cincinnati went in there with all these with all these high-flying weapons and this hot-shot quarterback and just ran the ball down their throat. Not not to say they didn't make plays um, with Jamar Chase in that game or, or, or in, and Joe Burrow, but they were able to run the ball when they needed to in bad weather conditions. And I almost wonder – that's kind of a uh, a prototype for what the Bills are going to do this offseason uh, as they look to rebound from uh, two consecutive uh, disappointing playoff exits. Um, did you say Cincinnati's the best team against the spread? In the AFC, yes. Wow, that's surprising. And they're and on Kansas a 10 City's game worst winning. in the whole NFL, right? Kansas City is the worst, yes. 5 12 just, and 1. Just AFC or in NFL? Uh, in the NFL. Wow. That's interesting that the Bengals, because you would think that they'd be, they went to the Super Bowl last year. Yep. And, and I, I like, you know, here's what happened with the Bengals, I, I think. They started the year so slowly. You know, they had those ugly performances. You know, they lost to the Steelers in week one. Um, they got their butts whipped by the Cowboys in week two. And I almost wonder if I go, oh, Super Bowl hangover, here we go. And 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 the power rankings just never caught up with that is my – even though, I mean, they're playing uh, – I mean, I, I, I think you can make an easy argument they're the best team in the NFL left. I mean, there's only four teams left, so it's not that hard to do. But um, they're, they're playing really well right now on their winning streak. Let's talk about when the Chiefs have the ball. Before we do that, Joe, I did want to mention um, we're three weeks away from Valentine's Day. You really need to go to myfrontpagestory.com. Talking about you, Joe, for Valentine's Day for your wife. What, what do you normally get her? Like flowers, maybe take her out to dinner. She would be so happy, so impressed if you did something a little bit different this year and got a story written all about her. You're the famous Joe Dolan. You're on the radio. You're on all these shows. How about putting her on the front page of a newspaper story? It's written all about her, all the quotes about how much you appreciate everything she does for you. I'm just telling you, she will cry. You will win. Myfrontpagestory.com. Myfrontpagestory.com. What's the front page of Monday's story, Joe, as it relates to the Chiefs' offense? Front page, back page, middle page. It's the Patrick Mahomes injury. Um, probably a high ankle sprain. I mean, I think that's what they're 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 saying. Yeah, probably a multi week absence if this is during the regular season, at least one week. But with the birth of the Super Bowl on the line, as impressive as he was last week, I don't think the 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 bank uh, the the Chiefs want to throw Chad Henney out there. Um, Lou Anarumo Ross, tell me about this, this guy, because he's been kind of like, uh, I, I would think 99% of NFL fans heading into the postseason could not have told you who the Bengals defensive coordinator was. And now he's the talk of the town. What is this guy doing so special that he has just made guys like Josh Allen just look completely foolish here the last number of weeks? Yeah, he's, uh. He's good. I mean, the thing is, they don't have, like, Hall of Fame players or even really all pro players. They just have a bunch of good players. Yep. You know, like, Logan Wilson's good. Hubbard's good. Hendrickson's good. Reader's good. Bates is good. I mean, they just have – and and uh, I can't believe the guy doesn't have one interview. Not one. Pretty wild. You look at some of the people getting interviewed. Like, the Colts have interviewed everybody other than Louie Anarumo. I don't get it. 
Well, whatever the case, I think the Bengals are happy to have him. And and look, I mean, Josh Allen last week, I know he was dealing with the elbow injury um, the second half of the season, but it wasn't a mobility injury. Patrick Mahomes with a mobility injury, that second reaction ability for Patrick Mahomes is so uh, impressive and so dangerous. And I don't think uh, the Bengals are going to take Patrick Mahomes for granted uh, in this game, but it does make him a little bit easier to defend. Um, Travis Kelsey, um, <laughs> of course, he didn't score in any of his final six regular season games, and then he catches 14 passes and scores two touchdowns in the in the playoff opener. The Bengals kind of a mediocre matchup uh, for tight ends. Um, the, Kadarius Tony has kind of become, even in a part-time role, the most important receiver for uh, the, the Kansas City Chiefs. And I think one of, one of the big reasons, and look, Mahomes is, is almost certainly going to win the MVP, um, uh, and I think one of the big reasons a lot of people are going to view that as the case is, look at his receiving core. I mean, yeah, it's Travis Kelsey's a Hall of Famer, but his best receiver is Kadarius Tony. Kadarius Tony caught five passes last week. He played 29% of the offensive snaps against the Jaguars. He is a part-time player, and he's outproducing basically everybody else at this receiving position. Um, Juju Smith-Schuster has posted four fewer targets, three or fewer catches, 38 or fewer receiving yards in seven of his last nine games. I mean, he's completely disintegrated in this offense. Um, And one of those down performances came against the Bengals in week 13 in that loss when he had just 35 yards. So Juju Smith-Schuster is not somebody I'm terribly interested in. Um, uh, Valdez Scantling is 28 or fewer receiving yards in six consecutive games. He did score last week. Justin Watson had just 12 yards. Sky Moore had three yards on two touches. I mean, the Kansas City Chiefs are a very Kelsey-oriented offense right now. Isaiah Pacheco-oriented offense. Jarek McKinnon out of the backfield. Um, Pacheco scored against the Bengals back in early December, as did McKinnon. Pacheco had a rushing touchdown. Jarek McKinnon had a receiving touchdown with Patrick Mahomes injured. I wouldn't be surprised to see this backfield be super important for them. Interesting. Um, yeah, I can see a lot of McKinnon and a lot of Pacheco in this game. I like that, Joe, a lot. Um, I think Anna Rumo's going to try and take away the quick, easy passes to yeah. try to force Mahomes to hold on to the ball and see, you know, the longer he holds it, the more he might have to move, which is what they want him to do, I think, which exactly. is usually the opposite of what you No, want. you definitely don't want him to move, but I think the Bengals do. Um, you know, might not be able to plan as much. I, I that it, That's going to be the most fascinating chess match because this is when you look at this roster the way I've just been showing you, and you're like, man, they really don't have all that. They're, they're extremely well coached. They have the best quarterback in the NFL, and they have a Hall of Fame tight end, Okay. So those are those are three big advantages. But outside of that, you're like, geez, Jarek McKinnon's their best offensive player? Speaks to uh, how well coached this team is. I think it's a good point. Uh, the Jags are very well coached as well, Joe. Um, just kind of your thoughts. They lost. I, I was actually pretty impressed how they just kept playing. They kept battling. Lawrence took them down for a touchdown to make it a three-point game. The Chiefs go down and score. Right, Lawrence comes right back. He's running, taking shots. And then Agnew fumbles at the five. But they were, I mean, they they showed me something. Because I kind of thought, all right, you beat the Titans at home on a, you know, whatever it was, strip sack against Dobbs. Okay, you beat the Chargers. The the Jags game, I mean, the, the Chiefs game actually made me more impressed with them. Yeah, and and keep in mind, um, you know, I was like, what are they going to do this offseason? You know, I was like, uh, Christian Kirk, uh, I, I think we know we all laughed at that signing, and I know what happened. He had that bad drop on that dime by Lawrence. Maybe the game changes if that doesn't happen. But he had a really good season. Zay Jones, oh, they gave him three years. Really good season. But I'm like, you know, they could really use one more guy. Marvin Jones is, is – Marvin Jones might be walking up the 18th fairway. Um and then I just sat there and I'm like, you know, what's out there? And then I'm like, oh yeah, they traded for Calvin Ridley. So I think with all that, I'm first and foremost, I'm fascinated to see where Calvin Ridley goes for a fantasy perspective. My guess is he'll probably be like a seventh or eighth round pick. I think Christian Kirk will get drafted ahead of him. But with all of that, ETN coming back, I think Trevor Lawrence is going to be the hot fantasy quarterback next year. I think he's going to be, well, if you didn't get your Hurts and you didn't get your Mahomes, you didn't get your you didn't get your Burrow, et cetera, et cetera, 
wait a couple rounds, go get Trevor Lawrence. That's what I kind of feel uh, is going to happen with, with Lawrence next year. Um, I think he's going to get drafted inside the top 12, maybe even inside the top 10 quarterbacks. And when you go look at the quarterbacks in the NFL and you try to rank them past like nine or 10, it does get really hard. Trevor Lawrence is going to breach that tier um, in the in the 2023 offseason. I think he's going to get drafted as a starter. People will expect him to be a, a weekly starter for fantasy next year. What about um, the Giants? It's interesting. They're going to bring Daniel Jones back. We talked about this exactly. with Joel Corey. Worst case scenario, they're franchise tagging Daniel Jones. Probably not the exclusive, the $32 million one. Or if somebody gave him a big offer, they get two first round picks. I still think Saquon goes back there. They just, because I don't think he's going to get the money he wants from anybody else either. Yeah. And, you know, Saquon, I thought he had a great season. Um, he maybe wasn't, maybe he was 90% of what he used to be, and the injuries have taken their toll. I think the Giants fans love him. I think he loves being there. I think you're probably right. They're going to come to an agreement. The Giants have a lot of salary cap. Now, here's the problem. They have to re-sign Daniel Jones, which is going to affect that salary cap. You have to re-sign Saquon, which is going to affect that salary cap. This is a team that needs wide receivers, and it's a team that needs wide receivers in the worst way. And look, Isaiah Hodgins, Richie James, uh, Darius Slayton, these guys were nice players for them. But when you get into the weeds against a team that has the dogs in the secondary that the Eagles do, those guys were non-factors in that game. I mean, Hodgins had the one bobbled catch. You know, Slayton did nothing in that game. I, I mean, uh, Slayton's a free agent, by the way. Uh, so uh, you would think maybe a couple of those guys, they decide uh, they decide to bring back. Um, but I would think the Giants are going to try to be aggressive uh, when it comes to wide receivers. Here is the problem. It is a terrible wide receiver market out there. And the Giants might have to get creative um, because all of their top receivers from last year, their top four wide receivers, you would say, and, and um, Sterling Shepard, by the way, uh, I, I would think you would say, uh, it's going to be rough for him to get back at age 30 after serious injury. He's a free agent. Richie James is a free agent. Darius Slayton's a free agent. Isaiah Hodgins is an exclusive rights free agent, which means he'll be back. So the Giants really have to get creative. I wouldn't be surprised to see Joe Shane exploring the trade market for a wide receiver this offseason. Good call, Joe. What about, kind of talked about the Bills a little bit, Cowboys. They're in a really tough spot because Zeke Elliott is expensive. Tony Pollard, you would think, I, I mean, he was their second best offensive player after C.D. Lamb. He's coming off a serious injury. He's a free agent. Dallas is in a rough spot because, look, uh, Ross, uh, you're paying Dak Prescott to be a lot better than he was in that game. And they made a mistake this offseason. They prioritized Michael Gallup over Amari Cooper and – I think, I think Jerry misread the market, got nothing for Cooper, signed a uh, signed a worse player to a bigger deal, um, and Dallas is going to have to pay the check for that. And their offensive line is getting older. Uh, uh, Tyler Smith, I thought he played, played well this season, but Tyron Smith, Zach Martin, all these guys are getting older. Um, they need help alongside CeeDee Lamb at wide receiver. Dallas has a really pivotal off season coming up. They don't have a ton of cap space. Um, do I, I expect they're going to be aggressive in every way possible because I think Jerry is going to know that that roster on offense, at least was not good enough. Um, and maybe they need to insulate. I don't know what you thought, Ross. I thought Dak Prescott was atrocious in that game. And maybe they need to insulate Dak Prescott more than they really would like for a guy who's going to have a $50 million cap number next year. Check him out on social at FG underscore Dolan. I'm at Ross Tucker NFL. You can always watch the show, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL, or just see the highlight clips at Ross Tucker Pod on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. Other than that, I'm stuffed. We're done. Thanks for listening to the Fantasy Feast podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Ross Tucker football podcast, Even Money, Business of Sports, and the College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found.